Hi there, I'm Michael Falk. I'm a lecturer in 18th century studies in the School of English at the University of Kent. Um, and today in this uh, electronic lecture, I'm going to talk to you about uh, Mary Shelley's magnificent novel of 1818, Frankenstein, and how you might want to compare this to Margaret Atwood's 1986 novel, The Handmaid's Tale. I've entitled the lecture Studies in Oppression because one thing that these two novels have in common is that they both consider what it means when society oppresses an individual, when society takes away an individual's freedom and dignity. Um, and although the two novels have this theme in common, they actually um, come up with a surprisingly different range of ideas about uh, this theme. So hopefully you find this useful as you uh, revise these novels and think about how to write on them together for your coursework. Okay, so to address oppression in Frankenstein and the Handmaid's Tale, I'm going to pose two questions. Firstly, what does oppression do to a person? What does it mean to be oppressed? What's it like to be oppressed? We'll see that the two novels answer this question in two quite different ways. And secondly, um, how do we remember oppression? Uh, obviously, oppression happens at some point in time, and then time passes, and then it's, it's in the past. Um, and it didn't happen to us, it happened to them over there in a different time and place. How do we remember oppression? What's the right way to do that? Um, and again, Mary Shelley and Margaret Atwood, um, although they both want us to remember oppression and both hope that by remembering it, uh, we'll avoid doing it in the future, they have different ideas about how that happens in practice. Okay, so question one, what does oppression do to a person? Um, well, before we have a look at the novels themselves, let's just briefly think about what oppression is and how it works. If we imagine um, each person having two fundamental components, their body, their physical existence, and their mind, their mental existence, you can see that it's much easier to oppress someone's body than their mind. You can lock someone up, you can put them in jail, you can torture them, you can put manacles on them, um, you can impose rules about where they're allowed to go and what they're allowed to wear and how they're allowed to speak. You can do all these sorts of things to a person's body directly. So it's much easier to directly oppress a person by controlling their body than it is by controlling their mind. Of course, there are some ways you can control people's minds. You can brainwash them and do other things like that. And perhaps in the future, there'll be technology invented that allows um, evil people to directly control your mind. But for the time being, it remains a lot harder to directly oppress a person's mind than to oppress their body. So if we think about that body and mind, we can see that in these two novels, The Handmaid's Tale and Frankenstein, um, the oppression occurs in a slightly different way. So in The Handmaid's Tale, roughly speaking, we can say that there's a police state in which the body is tightly regulated. The main character of Fred, as you recall, is a handmaid who is made to um, have sex with one of the rulers of this repressive society, Gilead, um, because due to an ecological catastrophe, um, there's been a collapse in male fertility. Um, and in order to make this work, um, the handmaids like Alfred are dehumanised. They have their name taken away, they're made to wear certain clothes, they're made to live in certain places, they're made to act in certain ways. There's a whole bunch of rules that controls what they can do with their bodies. Uh, and those rules are enforced by a brutal police state. The situation in Frankenstein is quite different. In Frankenstein, um, except for one important subplot involving the character Justine, there isn't really an oppressive state. Instead, what you have is a prejudiced society in which the body is harshly judged. And if you've read the novel, you would know that Frankenstein's creature is repulsively ugly, and everywhere he goes, everyone rejects him or runs away from him or attacks him. And it's due to that prejudice, that cruelty towards him, in that his bodily appearance is harshly judged, it's due to that that he becomes evil and becomes a murderer and is driven into bitterness and hatred. So you can see that the oppression in Frankenstein is quite different to the oppression in The Handmaid's Tale. And as a result of this, the two novels come up with quite different ideas about how oppression works and what effect it has on the person who is oppressed. So here's a little quote from uh, chapter 14 of The Handmaid's Tale that shows one of the ways that Gilead oppresses the handmaids like Alfred. So at the beginning of this chapter, Alfred has gone into the room of the house that's called the sitting room. And when she gets there, this is what she says to herself. The sitting room would once have been called a drawing room, perhaps. 
they're in the living room. Or maybe it's a parlour, the kind with a spider and flies. But now it's officially a sitting room, because that's what's done in it by some. For others, there's standing room only. The posture of the body is important here and now. Minor discomforts are instructive. Okay, so let's zoom out for a second. The main point here is that in the household where Offred lives, there's a room called the sitting room, where the rulers of Gilead are allowed to sit, but the handmaids, like Offred, have to stand. And that's a rule. It's a rule that's enforced by the society. So this is a small way in which she's oppressed. Um, now let's unpack the passage and see how Atwood, in her brilliant way, puts her sentences together in order to draw out all the ideas behind this. So the first couple of sentences are interesting because they're not about Alfred's own society of Gilead, they're about the history. And you could say that what these couple of sentences give us is a social history of space, a history about how society has changed the way it uses the spaces inside the home. So before this thing was a sitting room, Alfred says it could have been, it was probably one of three other things. In the 18th or 19th century, it would have been a drawing room. The drawing room is the room to withdraw to after supper. It's where the, um, the wealthy members of the house would go so the servants could clean up the, the mess on the dinner table. Um, then later on, it might have become a living room. A living room in a more democratic society is the room to live in with your family. Everyone lives in the living room. Everything's there, the kitchen, the TV, the couch, the table. Everyone hangs out there. It's the living room for everyone together. Or perhaps this was a working class house that had a parlour. Um, the parlour, the special room, it's only for special occasions. In other words, it's a room not to use at all. And Alfred makes the first of several little jokes in this passage. She says the parlour might have had a spider and flies, i.e. because it was never actually used. Um, and we'll come back to her use of humour because it's quite important in this passage. Okay, so those first couple of um, sentences sketch this history of how rooms have been used in different societies to give us a bit of a context for what she says next. The next sentence zooms into what happens in her oppressive society of Gilead. But now it's officially a sitting room because that's what's done in it by some. Now this is an absolutely brilliant sentence, so I'm going to put it again down the bottom and we're going to unpack it. It's the only complex sentence in the paragraph. It's a complex sentence because it has a main clause, which says what it's about, that the room is a, officially a sitting room, and it has an, a dependent clause, uh, which gives the reason for that fact. In this case, it's called a sitting room because that's what's done in it, because it's sat in. People sit in there. Um, now let's unpack this sentence from the start. It begins with but now. But says that all of that previous history of all those different kinds of spaces is over. It's been replaced by this new order. But now it's something else. Now, in the passage, has two different meanings. It's now because Alfred is standing in the room right now, and it's her experience. And it's also now because she's referring to this situation now, the civilization she now lives in, her whole situation, this phase of history. Um, it's officially a sitting room. If you look carefully at the previous sentences, you'll see these things, drawing room, living room, parlour, they're not official titles, they're just the words that people use to describe a room in their house. But in Gilead, in this oppressive society, officialdom, the state, tells you what the rooms are called in your house, which is kind of remarkable when you think about it, that uh, in a police state, that it might creep into your very home and actually tell you what your rooms are called. Um, so that's the main clause of the sentence. Then what do we get in the dependent clause? And again, we can see Atwood's really, really, really stylish and does this so well. It's called the sitting room because that's what is done in it. And the thing I want you to notice here is she doesn't say it's called the sitting room because people sit in it. She uses the passive voice because that's what is done in it. And because she uses the passive voice, um, she doesn't tell you who does the sitting. She just says sitting happens. There is sitting. Sitting is done in the room. Um, and because she doesn't tell you that, it means that she can tack on to the end of the sentence a little punchline after the comma. By some. Only some people get to sit in the room. So this is what makes it oppressive. It's the sitting room. It's called the sitting room, but only some people get to sit there. Okay, now let's go on to the, the final bit of the passage. 
as Alfred said, for others, there's standing room only, like for her as a handmaid. Now again, we've got another little joke. Standing room only normally means something's very popular or very crowded. There was standing room only on the bus. The concert was so popular, there was standing room only. Um, there were so many people in the church at Christmas, it was standing room only, etc., etc. Um, but here, instead, um, there's standing room only because there's an oppressive law that says some people have to stand. And then Alfred tells us why there's this oppressive law. The posture of the body is important here and now. It matters that some people are standing and some are sitting. Minor discomforts are instructive. It's uncomfortable to stand up. It's just a minor discomfort. Why would they force just this petty minor discomfort on people? Because it's instructive. They're controlling off Red's body. They're making her stand to try and instruct her, to try and control her mind, to try and make her less of a person, to try and reduce her from a full, free, living human being into simply a uterus that society can use to produce babies, which is her function in this society. Now, the question is, does this society of Gilead succeed in oppressing Alfred and robbing her of her mind and her freedom? Um, and I would say, no, it doesn't. Uh, and that's what is the importance of humour in this passage uh, and the way uh, Alfred refers to the, the past uses of the room and the way Alfred is able to explain why she's made to stand up. She's perfectly aware of what is happening to her. She knows the full history um, she's able to detach herself from her experience and make some jokes about it. Um, and she's able to explain clearly to her listener, because of course she's recording this into a tape recorder. Um, she's able to explain to her listener exactly why she was made to do this. So even though the society is controlling her body, her, her mind, her rationality, her dignity, that all remains to her and they can't take that away from her. Okay, so that's a little example of oppression in The Handmaid's Tale. Let's have a look now at Frankenstein and see how the creature is oppressed in that novel. And you'll see it's quite different. So here I've just pulled out a scene from the middle of the book, from volume two, when the creature is recounting the story of his life to Victor Frankenstein. Um, and in this point, the creature has discovered the de Lacy family, who are the cottagers who live um, in a forest in Switzerland. Um, and he's by watching them, he's learning to read and learning about domesticity, learning what it means to have a father and, and siblings and how you live together in a house and so on. He's learning all that by watching them through the window. Um, so, and this is what he says about this time. I improved, however, sensibly in this science. He means he noticed that he was getting better at reading. He improved in the science of reading, but not sufficiently to follow up any kind of conversation. Although I applied my whole mind to the endeavor, for I easily perceived that, although I eagerly longed to discover myself to the cottagers, I ought not to make the attempt until I had first become master of their language, which knowledge might enable me to make them overlook the deformity of my figure. For with this also the contrast perpetually presented to my eyes had made me acquainted. I had admired the perfect forms of my cottagers, their grace, beauty, and delicate complexions, but how I was terrified when I viewed myself in a transparent pool, at first I started back, unable to believe that it was indeed I who was reflected in the mirror. And when I became fully convinced that I was in reality the monster that I am, I was filled with the bitterest sensations of despondence and mortification. Okay, Shelley's language can be a little bit hard sometimes, but I hope you followed that. So, in the first paragraph, the monster's, the creature's saying, um, I was watching the de Lacy family and learning to read and I wanted to master their language before showing myself to them, before discovering myself to them, because if I could only speak to them they would hear my voice and know that I'm a good person and look past the deformity of my appearance. And in the second paragraph he describes how beautiful he found the appearance of the cottages and how disgusting by contrast he finds his own appearance when he sees himself reflected in a pond. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit. Um, the creature is learning the science or the knowledge of reading. Um, this is really important in the book. Um, the creature learns what it means to be a human and what it means to be free from some books that he reads. In particular, Paradise Lost by John Milton, The Ruins by uh, Volney, and John Milton's uh, and um, Goethe's novel, The Sorrows of Young Werther. He reads these books and he learns what it means to be human and uh, what makes for a good life. Um, so that's important for us to just 
keep in mind as we go on. Um, the creature, the second really crucial thing from this first passage is the creature's idea of what language can do. So the creature feels uh, oppressed because his body is so ugly to all the people he encounters that he can't have any communion with anybody. He can't make friends or exist in society. But he thinks that language has a special power. Language moves from mind to mind. If I can only speak to you, you'll see or hear my mind and ignore my body. Um, and actually, in the novel, the creature's right. This is exactly what language can do. It works. At this point in the book, the creature's talking to Victor Frankenstein. Um, and as soon as Frankenstein hears the creature talk and hears his story, he immediately starts to sympathise with the creature and more or less forgets that the creature is, is ugly and deformed. So the creature's actually right. Language, at least in this book, seems to have the power to overcome the different prejudices and barriers that cause oppression. Um, so it's kind of an optimistic idea that. Um, a final thing I want you to, to take out of this first paragraph is this key phrase, my eyes. Um, so the creature's talking about the deformity of his figure, and he says that um, his eyes had made him acquainted with the deformity of his own figure. His eyes had taught him he was ugly because of the contrast perpetually presented to him. In other words, the contrast between his own ugly body and the beautiful bodies of the cottagers. And the fact that it's his eyes that teach him this raised the question, who is really oppressing the creature? Is society oppressing the creature? Or is the creature oppressing himself with his own ideas and his own senses and his own thoughts? Um, we'll come back to that question in a second. So in the second paragraph, um, this, this, this idea of the creature oppressing himself with his own eyes is, is developed a little bit more. In the first case, he refers to the perfect form of forms of his cottages, and by forms he means their bodies, their outward appearance, their structure, their form when you look at them. And he picks out their grace, beauty, and delicate complexions. You know, if you've read novels from this, com this period, you'll know that a delicate complexion means white, unblemished skin. Um, and this again comes back to the issue of who's oppressing the creature and how. Why has the creature learnt that white unblemished skin is the most beautiful kind of skin? Um, he's of course been born in uh, Western Europe, in Switzerland, Germany. These are the places he spends his time. So presumably if he'd been born in another part of the world, he might have learnt that a different sort of skin was beautiful. So again, we have this 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 strange uh, uh, relationship in the novel between the creature's ideas and society's ideas. Um, no one's taught him specifically um, that white skin is beautiful, unless it's in those books he read. Um, he seems to be picking that up himself, and yet he's what it, the way he's learning is by observing what people do in society and copying them. So there's this, this relationship between society's ideas and the creature's own ideas. And society's ideas seem to creep into the creature's mind and become his own ideas. Um, and this uh, sort of poisoning of the creature's own mind ultimately has quite a tragic outcome, which is that the creature's frightened of his own reflection. When he looks at his own reflection, he's disgusted and he hates what he sees. He believes he is in reality the monster that he is. It's a bit of a tautology there. I am in reality the monster that I am. We're saying the same thing twice. Um, but uh, again, there's two different interpretations. Either society has successfully oppressed him. It's persuaded him that he's evil and wrong and he shouldn't be the way he is. Or the creature is oppressing himself and he's looked at society and the problem is that he's wrongly wanting to imitate what society says rather than thinking for himself. And it's very difficult to separate those two interpretations. So I hope you can see that these two novels present very different ideas about oppression. In The Handmaid's Tale, Alfred is able to preserve the freedom of her mind and to detach herself from the society that is oppressing her through its rules and restrictions and see it for what it is, which is a, a gross and oppressive um, and stupid society. Um, the creature, on the other hand, um, he, he can't be oppressed in body. He's much stronger and more powerful than everyone around him. He's also more intelligent and wittier and more eloquent than everyone else in the novel. He's superior in body and mind. But because of his fierce desire to belong, um, his mind is easily oppressed. 
He sucks in all of society's prejudices and comes to believe that he himself is ugly, as society has told him he is. Um, so there's two different visions there of how humans are oppressed and how easy it is to steal the freedom of somebody's mind. Okay, the second question that the two novels pose is how do we remember oppression? Um, and both of the novels actually explore this theme using the same literary technique, which is quite a nice, makes it quite easy to compare them. Both of them use what's sometimes called the found manuscript trope. A trope is just another way of saying literary technique. Um, so in a found manuscript novel, the novel pretends, instead of being a novel, it pretends to be a document that someone's found in a box somewhere. Um, so a famous example of that is The Lord of the Rings, if you've read that, which supposedly was written by um, Bilbo Baggins in the Red Book of Westerness. So uh, it's pretending like J.R.R. Tolkien didn't write it, that it was in fact written by Bilbo Baggins and then translated. Uh, you know, another really famous novel that's like that is Don Quixote, if you know that, uh, where Cervantes pretends, claims to have found a history of Don Quixote in a marketplace and translated it into Spanish from the Arabic. So both of Frankenstein and The Handmaid's Tale both use this technique. So in Frankenstein, on the very first page, um, if you haven't read the book before, you, it's sometimes a bit surprising, the first character you meet is a Mrs. Margaret Saville, um, who someone is writing a letter to. Um, the person who's writing a letter to her is Captain Walton, and the entire book of Frankenstein are Captain Walton's letters to his sister, Margaret Saville, back in England. Captain Walton's on a ship in the Arctic, and some weird things are happening to him, and he's writing the letters back to Margaret Saville. And the bulk of the novel is the story that Victor Frankenstein tells to Captain Walton, which Captain Walton then writes in his letters, which he sends to Margaret Saville, which are then published in the form of the novel. Um, and we only find out the creature's side of the story, his experience of repression, when the creature tells his story to Victor Frankenstein, who tells it to Captain Walton, who writes it in his letters, who sends it to Margaret Saville in England. Um, except there is one little exception to that right at the end of the book after Victor Frankenstein has died. The creature does briefly talk to Walton at the very end of the book. And so there is a little bit where Walton directly hears from the creature and then puts it in his letters and sends it off to Margaret Savile in England. Okay, there's a similar thing going on in The Handmaid's Tale, though it's quite differently done. When you open The Handmaid's Tale, from the very beginning, you're getting Alfred, the main character, telling her story of her experience. So we start off with Alfred. Um, but we discover at the end of the book that what she's actually doing is telling her story into a tape recorder and then hiding her recording on some music cassettes. So she records her story onto some music cassettes, um, which are then 200 years later in the 2190s, in the 22nd century. Those cassettes are discovered by two professors, Professor Wade and Professor Pierre Zotto. They discover the cassettes they build a cassette player to decode the cassettes because tape cassettes don't exist anymore in the 22nd century. And then they analyse the cassettes to work out exactly what um, Alfred's referring to when she refers to all of these old 200-year-old places like New Jersey and Maine and so on. Uh, and then Professors Wade and Piazzotto write a transcript of what Alfred says, and that's what we have in the book, the published transcript of um, her recorded autobiography, and they also present this, um, this uh, transcript to a learned society of fellow historians, which is in the, the back of the book in the historical notes section. You have Professor Piazzotto's talk to the society about this new manuscript, this new set of tapes that he and Professor Wade have discovered and decoded and are now publishing so the world can know about it. So what's interesting is that in both of these novels. At the bottom of the chain is the oppressed person. Um, they try to tell their story and it only gets to us, the public, by going through a number of intermediaries who remember it for us and then, do, and then give it to us. You know, we get the story of the creature from Margaret Saville, her letters that she received from her brother Captain Walton, and we only get Alfred's story um, from the published transcript made by Professors Wade and Piazzotto. Uh, and one other interesting point in both the books is that the oppressed person's name is forgotten. The creature never really has a name. Um, and Alfred, we don't know her real name. We only know this Alfred made-up name that guilt, the oppressive society has given her to try and take away her identity. Another point that's in common in both of them is that 
Um, in both cases, there's an academic <laughs> in the chain. Dr. Frankenstein's the one who tells us about the creature, and it's Professor Wade and Professor Piazzotto who tell us about Offred. Um, now, on the one hand, an academic might be the right person to tell us. Only Dr. Frankenstein really understands how the creature was made. And Professors Wade and Piazzotto, they're experts on Gilead history, so they're the right persons to ask about it. But on the other hand, um, they're academics. They don't really know what it's like to be oppressed in the way the creature or Offred were. So, you know, how is the message being altered by academics being the ones who hand things on? Um, and finally, both novels um, make us think, who's the public who's being addressed by this story? You know, does it make a difference that Frankenstein is a story told by a man to his sister compared to The Handmaid's Tale, which is a story told by some historians to some other fellow historians? Um, how does that uh, affect the way that this oppression is remembered? So all of these things are things that the two novels have in common. There's, there's one point that is a little bit different, and that's this, that... Um, in The Handmaid's Tale, we have a more direct access to Alfred's own testimony than in Frankenstein. In Frankenstein, we have letters written by Captain Walton about what happened and everything he knows from second or third hand. Um, whereas, uh, at least in The Handmaid's Tale, it is Alfred's own testimony that's been recorded, even if it has been transcribed later on by some other people. It's her own voice directly speaking to us. So that's a point of contrast between the two novels and you might like to think about that. You know, what does it mean when the creature talks for most of Volume 2 in Frankenstein? Technically speaking, we're not hearing the creature. We're hearing Victor Frankenstein saying what the creature said to Walton, who then writes it down. Um, yet it seems when we're reading it that we're hearing the creature directly. You know, you might, you might have different thoughts about um, this relationship. Okay, now to compare the two novels' use of this trope, I'm just going to finish off with two quotes, one from Frankenstein, one from Handmaid's Tale, that show the different way that Shelley and um, Atwood use this found manuscript trope. So the first quote there on the left is from Frankenstein. So this is Captain Walton at the end of the novel talking to his sister about the story he's just told her. You have read this strange and terrific story, Margaret, and do you not feel your blood congealed with horror like that which even now curdles mine? Such a monster has then really existence. I cannot doubt it, yet I am lost in surprise and admiration. Sometimes I endeavoured to gain from Frankenstein the particulars of his creature's formation, while on this point he was impenetrable. Okay, so there's the horrified Walton reflecting on the terrible narrative he's just heard and the real existence of this poor oppressed creature. Now here is Professor Piazzotto at the end of The Handmaid's Tale. This item, but he's referring to the tapes of Alfred's... Um, Autobiography. This item, I hesitate to use the word document, was unearthed on the site of what was once the city of Bangor in what, at the time prior to the inception of the Gileadian regime, would have been the state of Maine. We know that this city was a prominent way station on what our author, refer author refers to as the Underground Female Road, since dubbed by some of our historical wags the Underground Frail Road. Laughter groans from the audience at the academic conference. For this reason, our association has taken a particular interest in it. Okay, you've probably heard the completely different tone of these two passages, but let's just identify a couple of crucial points of contrast between them. So, in Frankenstein, Walton's response to the narrative that Victor's told him um, is horror. His blood congeals. And later on he says he feels surprise and admiration. He's what a powerful emotional response to this tale of um, a man trying to master nature and then the cruel oppression of this creature. On the other hand, over here, uh, Professor Piazzotto doesn't seem to be that emotional at all. In fact, he's kind of pedantic. You know, does it really matter if Alfred's tapes count as a document or not? Why doesn't he just tell us where they were found? Why does he go on for so long about, you know, unearthed on the site of what was once the city of Bangor, in what, at the time, prior to blah, 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 blah. It's very pedantic and precise, and he's going on and on about things that don't seem that directly relevant to the main topic of the actual story that we've just heard. He doesn't say a word about the oppression of women. He just bangs on about all this other academic stuff. 
And similarly, there's another um, theme that these two have in common that is treated a little bit differently. So uh, in Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein refuses to tell Walton how to create another creature. On this point, he's impenetrable. So there's a determination on Frankenstein's part, and also in the end on Walton's part, for this kind of thing not to happen again. They're not going to repeat the mistakes of the past. And in fact, that's kind of symbolised when Walton gives up on his own quest to try and master nature and decides to leave the Arctic where he's stranded on his ship. Uh, so he kind of agrees with Frankenstein, we mustn't do this again. We mustn't um, be oppressors again. Whereas, um, in the academic conference, um, they're laughing, they're joking about it. There's such a historical distance that it doesn't seem that vital an issue anymore. Um, uh, and in fact, the professor makes a rather off-colour joke. So, Alfred refers to the network of people who help handmaids escape Gilead as the Underground Female Road, which is a reference to the Underground Railroad, which was a network of people who helped slaves in the US South escape to the free states of the North during slavery. Um, and some historical wags, in other words, some people who make jokes about history, have renamed this underground female road the Underground Frail Road, which is a sexist joke about how women are frailer than men. So, um, the point here is that uh, rather than hearing Alfred's story and reconsidering sexist attitudes and being more attuned to the way that society might fall back into um, the problems that Gilead faced 200 years before, this academic audience at this distance of time is just not very real to them, this oppression of the past. So I think if you, if you zoom out on both of these books, Frankenstein in a way is the much more optimistic book because Frankenstein says that language has the power to overcome oppression and when the story of the creature is told, it invokes horror and people try to make sure not to repeat that mistake again. Whereas The Handmaid's Tale, which is a really a very brutal and savage tale, when it's told, Atwood suggests, um, people just laugh and joke about it and it fades off into the past and leaves open the possibility that all of this will happen again and we'll forget those lessons of the past. So it actually ends on quite a pessimistic note, The Handmaid's Tale. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that lecture on uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, and I hope that's provoked you to think about the different ways that these two authors talk about um, the way society can oppress individuals, and the way individuals might respond to that oppression, and the way we, who remember this oppression, um, might uh, adjust our own behaviour to try and avoid it in the future. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, I'm more than happy for you to email me. There's my email on uh, the screen. Um, mgfork at chem.ac.uk um, and I have, hope you have good luck with your English A-level.